What's going on today, YouTube? Welcome back to another video. Very exciting stuff. I'm building an AMD Ryzen R9 5950 system to go along with my Intel 10900K. I see a lot of people watching and not subscribing. We've talked about this before. Go ahead and smash that subscribe button, punch the like button. Don't be a wise guy. You know you enjoy the content. In any case, guys, let's get right into it. We're going to talk about the AMD Ryzen R9 5950X. That's what I'm building today. But why am I doing that if I have a 10900K? Well, we're going to get to that. Now, there are multiple options for the R9 5950, 5900 as well. And the three of those that I think are the best option are the ASUS B550 XE, the ASUS X570 ROG Strix, and of course, the Crosshair 8 Hero which is the X570 chipset, but there's also the Dark Hero. Now, the difference between the Dark Hero and the regular Hero is the dynamic OC switcher or overclock switcher. Basically, what that means is, is with AMD, when you overclock and sync all cores, you lose your boost frequency. The reason I did not get that board and went with the Crosshair 8 Hero is because I'm not exactly sure of it, and sometimes new technology like that can introduce problems. I'm not sure how stable it is because of dynamic switching. It's going to go back and forth between syncing all cores an overclock or a standard clock with boost and that is great however if it switches at the wrong time it could give you a watchdog timeout or something like that in windows we don't want that i'm not saying that's going to happen but it's so new i just didn't want to take the chance on that i'm going to see how that board fares over the next couple of months with a lot of other people before i really dive into it i have no problem syncing all cores or reducing the overclock to get the boost back i don't mind messing with the overclock at all i'm used to doing that with intel a lot of the time anyway so not a big deal if you guys are looking for the best motherboards the msi godlike is also good but i haven't used msi in a while i also love gigabyte but overall, I think ASUS has the best boards. Big three options here is the B550, which has got the new VRMs, which is a little bit more stable and higher memory speed for overclocking ability. So it's slightly better, newer, and comes preloaded with the Ryzen R9 5900 and 5950 BIOS updated already. The B550 XE Gaming, which is the ROG Strix from ASUS, is also a newer board. It was just released a few months ago. Now, the only thing is, it does not have an all 4.0 PCI Express motherboard. Only one slot is PCI Express 4.0, the other is 3.0, and only one M.2 slot is four times, whereas the other one is slower. Unlike the X570 ROG Strix motherboard, that is all PCI Express 4.0 and both M.2 slots for hard drives are times four. Same with the Crosshair Hero. However, the Crosshair Hero 8 also has a clear CMOS button on the back instead of having to remove the battery, which is kind of hidden behind or just blowing behind the big old fat 3080 or 3090 graphics cards or whatever card you're using. You really can't get at it. It's just such a hassle. So it's worth spending the money. So it works a lot better. So I don't got to pop that video card out, battery out and cable out just to reset the CMOS and BIOS for 30 seconds because of an unstable overclock or memory overclock. So definitely a good choice. And considering the B550XE gaming is only 20 or $30 less than the Crosshair Hero 8 or only about 60 bucks less than the Dark Hero, it makes no sense to really buy that board. I really think you should look at the X570 ROG Strix from ASUS, which is $299, and then jump up to the Crosshair 8 at $379, and then you could spend $20 extra on the Dark Hero with the OC switcher. Although I, the VRMs are newer and better in the B550, it just doesn't make any sense to spend basically crosshair hero 8 money on a board that is only half pci express 4.0 in any case the best speed for memory is 4 gigahertz one to one ratio with the 5950 so we're going to clock it at 4 gigahertz and we're going to try for 16 18 18 34 timing we're going to go ahead and start the build i've done a couple of things right quick but first got to get in the shelby and drive up to micro center get the processor and the board and get back here let's get going <laughs> So if you guys like cars or you're interested in racing or anything automotive related, check out my car channel, Driveway Demons, right there on the bottom of the screen. I'm doing a cross vlog right now.
I got a few things done before I started the video. Shouldn't have done that, but did it anyway. I just wanted to get this cooler mounted. So I'm gonna go over what I've done here because uh, we've skipped a step or two and I don't want you guys to miss out on that. First, I removed the fan up in here. You guys can see right there on the top. I got rid of that. And I did that because that fan sucks. So I took it out and I'm replacing it with a Corsair RGB fan. A lot quieter, more airflow. Looks better too. With the NZXT 510 case, uh, this is a very easy case to set up for your cooler. Pretty easy. This front little bracket here, these fans were screwed directly into it from the other side into these fans. So I removed the four screws top and four screws bottom, let the fans come down, got these fans from Corsair mounted, the RGB fans to the cooler. And then I went ahead and took the fans and mounted them through the brace into the cooler with the other eight extended screws, four on each fan. And now I have a push and pull setup, which is going to work with very little turbulence because of the spacing created by this without getting into a long, a drawn out, boring uh, explanation. You wouldn't want these fans to be any closer. There'd be turbulence. I would like to see them further apart. This is all done. You guys can see that you want to mount it with the cooler hoses coming from the top, not the bottom. It's this specific case, I mean, that's how you're gonna wanna set that up. Also, you guys don't have to remove the front glass, but if you want to, there's a small little screw here on either side. Uh, you guys can see that right there. Very easy to take off and the glass just pulls forward. As far as these cables, these are coming from the Corsair cooler fans. We are going to manage these cables, don't worry. This is all the stuff right here from the front of the case. We have our power. Then of course we have our USB 2 header, USB 3 Gen 2 or USB 3.1 Gen 2, the front panel right here, the HD audio, and then last but not least, the USB 3.1 Gen 1. So those stay over here along with, of course, the SATA power. And then this right here is the pre-wired fans from NZXT. These are your front fans, top fan and rear. We have moved the top fan out of position so we don't have to worry about plugging that in over here they had it set up on fan number three the corsair fan will not go here so this is only going to control the two front fans and the rear fan that's the only thing the nzxt is going to be controlling now with their software you guys can see these cables are managed pretty good i'm going to have this kind of cable tied right here and hidden nice and flat. These cables will no longer do anything now. So I'm gonna try to get this tied up and tucked under here as neatly as possible. We're gonna go ahead and start with the top one. You guys can see right here, I've got these cables. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get them pushed through. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's this hole back here. So what I'm gonna do is try to fit my fingers back here. It's gonna be difficult, it really is, but uh, just because of room, it's gonna be tight. I know there's probably a better way to do this, but I don't feel like pulling that front glass off again just to save a few seconds. I'm gonna pull those fans through here. They're coming out the back side. Right back there, you guys can see. We're gonna go ahead and finger tighten these. Uh, NZXT goes crazy on these from the factory. They come so tight, you need a screwdriver to get them off, which is ridiculous, but uh, it is what it is. All right, there we go. So that's mounted. It's solid, it's in place. You guys can see here, no wires. All these wires back here are gonna be taped. Everything's gonna be clear. When it's all said and done, there's gonna be nothing. Everything's gonna come from the bottom, the side of the top and be organized. It's gonna be nice and open. Everything is tucked in here. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna get these fans hooked up. Before we get the power cable hooked up on the motherboard, we want these fans all hooked up and organized. This way we're not trying to organize a complete mess at the end. My real tactic when I build computers, I kind of cable manage as I go so things don't get out of control. So what I'm gonna do now is go to this side. You can see the front of the computer is already looking pretty stellar with those fans completely organized. These are the top cables. You can see that one says to the RGB hub and the other does not. This is your fan. When we bring these across over here, the RGB controller hub is this side, fans are this side. That means the one with the yellow sticky right here is going to go over here. Top fan is gonna be number one, bottom fan is gonna be number two, and then the top fan that I'm replacing up here is gonna be number three. This way we know which fan is which inside of program software. I'm going to remove this bracket from the NZXT because I really want these cables out of the way. All right, so we're gonna put them through the top just like I did here. 
We're gonna bring them down with all the other fan cables just like this. It's okay if they're kind of coming across here. They're, I don't plan on putting a hard drive there. RGB controller number one, top fan has been connected. And then fan number one right here. Make sure to line up the guides. This is the hub. It's got a USB and a power connector. So we're gonna need the motherboard and CPU in as well as the power supply Then we can get this stuff hooked up. The same goes for the front panel connections, which is the only stuff we've got left. Everything is neatly organized. It is time to get the motherboard set up with the CPU. Got the motherboard right here. Time to get her opened up. Oh, I like how this board opens up in comparison to the other board. The uh, Crosshair Hero has definitely got a better box and more well-organized than the ROG Strix. Uh, so in any case, we're gonna get this motherboard out and get the CPU in. This is a very high-end board. In fact, I definitely prefer ASUS over any other board. Cables, miscellaneous stuff, mounting hardware. Here's the antenna right there. We'll use that in just a bit. Some SATA cables, which I won't use front panel connector stuff, uh, extension for extra RGB con connectors and whatnot, like lighting for the case, extra lighting connectors. This is the M.2 SATA. And then there is some other cables here, miscellaneous extension cables. Don't need any of that right now. Crazy amount of connections. The BIOS flashback, we got the type C. We got the 2.5G ethernet cables. We have two generations of USB 3.1 and then the regular USB 3.0s. SPDIF, microphone in, sub line in, line out, and rear connections. We have the BIOS flashback button as well as the clear CMOS and the Wi Fi connection. So, a lot of connections here, guys. It'd be almost impossible to get this battery out, as you guys can see, right where the GPU sits. So, the clear CMOS button is definitely needed. This also has a start button on the motherboard, which some of the lower end boards, if not most of them, do not have. We're only going to be using two sticks of memory. So, it's going to go in the second slot right here and the fourth slot. And there is the CPU pin connector right there. The eight plus four power is up here. We have all our connections down here. This is the USB three Gen two or the USB 3.1 Gen two. We're going to go ahead and get the Samsung SATA drive installed. And we're going to start by opening the M.2 SATA port, which is going to be right behind this cooler. These screws are tiny. Be careful not to lose them. Can be a little tricky. We got a fan right here. Note the fan to cool the bridge off. The Strix motherboard did not have that. It was optional, but you had to install it. That is the fan shroud cover. This is the second screw right here for the M.2 hard drive or SSD. Here is my Samsung Evo, 970 Evo. I should have got the Evo Plus, but there was none in stock at that time. Slightly better write speeds on the Evo Plus. If you guys have never done this before, your SSD is gonna go right in here and line up. You don't have to mess with the other stuff under here because this is already the perfect size. And then it's gonna line up right with the grooves right here. There, you can hear the click. It fits right down in there, no problem. This right here they provide is the spacer for the board, which you guys can see was not needed. Okay, so we don't have to put the screw in here because this plate already has a screw and of course an insulator pad that's gonna keep it in place and help keep it cool. So this is the 5950 guys. This is the best CPU on the market right now. This is a much larger processor than the Intel. In fact, it's larger than all of them that I've seen. Uh, you can see the pins are different than they are on Intel's. Pinning on the motherboard and CPU is different than Intel. Okay, guys, with the Ryzen CPU, you can see there's an arrow in the top right corner of the processor. And right here on the board, you can see that there is an arrow right here kind of pointing in. And that is where we're going to align the processor. You're going to want to have the Ryzen letters kind of facing this way. So when you're looking at the board, this is the orientation that the processor should be in. We're gonna gently go ahead and drop the processor very slowly and gently onto the board. And there you go. It's perfectly in place. You don't wanna press hard at all. You'll damage a pin, gotta do it gently. Then we're gonna pull this arm down right here. 
and lock it in place right there. Remember, like I said, guys, second slot, fourth slot, if you're not using at least four dims, make sure your RAM lines up completely when you're installing it, as you guys can see here. If it was this way, you guys can see that would not line up properly. So always check before you install your RAM so you don't damage the board or the RAM itself. Okay, guys, these coolers come set up for Intel. So you gotta take these Intel plates off, which are right here. They just kind of pull out, just like I'm gonna show you, because I've got it set up for AM4. And then you're gonna install these AM4 plates just like I have them set up on either side. They just clip right in, very easy. And then the mounting hardware goes as follows. There's only two of these thumb screws to use with these two hook clamps, one on either side, leave them loose. One on either side, make sure they're pressed both in nicely like that. I cleaned up the thermal paste so I could use Arctic Silver. So now we're placing the motherboard into the case. This case is already set up for these ASUS boards or ATX boards in general. Make sure the back panel lines up. Everything lined up perfectly. So we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight screws to mount. First screw is in. The second screw is going in right now. Do not tighten any of the screws until you've got all of them loosely installed. Otherwise you could run into a problem and end up having to back them off anyway. The board is now installed. All right, guys, time to get the thermal paste set up. This is gonna go through the top out of the way. It's gonna connect to the controller at the top that we've already mounted on the side. And then this little header cable is gonna go to the CPU at the top of the motherboard. Mount this one side at the top first. We're gonna pull straight up. And I'm gonna go ahead and get the other side hooked in. Once I do that, I'm going to get everything onto the CPU. It's now on the CPU. I'm gonna try to not let it skate or dance around. I want this sliding around all over the cooler and spreading the thermal paste all over the place. Definitely don't want that. Gonna tighten this on the top, on the bottom. We're gonna go back and forth little by little. All right, guys, we got the cooler installed. We're gonna go ahead and run this connection here to the CPU fan. Can't see it, but the top one is the opt. The one below it is the fan. The third one is the pump. So it's gonna go in this middle one right here. I'm gonna attach it to this cable that I'm putting through the top. So this is how you guys would do that. This is the connector for the cooler or the pump. It's gonna go right here on the top of this controller just like that we're going to organize this cable try to get everything organized the best as i possibly can so that's going to be managed pretty well once i zip tie it in there it's not gonna be perfect right now but it's where it needs to be this is going to connect to the motherboard this is the gen 1 3.1 usb this right here is the usb 2.0 which we're going to go under the bottom because it's on the bottom of the board this is the HD audio, which is gonna go on the bottom. This on the cooler itself is USB 2.0, so it's gonna go on the bottom. Then this right here is the Gen 2 3.1 USB, which is gonna go right in here. And then this right here is the F panel, which is also going to go on the bottom. We're gonna hook up the SATA power to the front panel, as well as the SATA power right here to the RGB controller once we hook up the power supply. Here is the USB 2.0. We've got two of those headers here. You guys can see there's a one spot right here missing. That goes on the bottom. That's how you align the one pin is not present. I'm gonna go ahead and get this USB controller plugged in for the front panel. There we go. Here is the generation one USB 3.1. Gonna turn this around. There we go, that's installed perfectly. We've got the USB connector right there. Now we're gonna run the USB connector for the RGB controller. We're gonna go ahead and get this HD audio, which is gonna go all the way over here on this side of the board. HD audio goes up here on this board. If you guys are using it, you guys can see the top pin, second from the right is not there. Same with this connector. So this is the HD audio. There we go. On most boards, it's gonna be on the bottom left anyway. Gonna go ahead and get this USB connected. We're gonna put the RGB controller 
on the left USB 2.0. Get those firmly inserted. Now we're gonna go ahead and connect our F panel. This is the F panel connector, typically is on the lower right of the motherboard. And you see on the F panel, it's missing one of the corner pins. And if you notice in the front, you notice if you look really closely right there, you've got one top right pin missing, same as this one. That is your F panel connection. We're gonna go ahead and plug that up. We got both our USBs, the one for the RGB controller right here, the one for the front panel here, HD audio in the front panel, as well as the front panel connector itself and both USBs. The entire front panel is done. All right, we're gonna get this power supply installed. Fan on the bottom, of course. I'm gonna slide this into the back, get it mounted. All right, guys, I got all the cables tied up and organized in the back pretty decently. Got the 24 pin finished as well as the CPU eight pin plus four up at the top. I got the two graphic card power cables on the bottom ready to go. It's time to install the GPU. Then we're gonna finalize all the cable management, get everything closed up, do the BIOS update and boot this baby up. So we got the RTX 3080. It's the Tough Gaming by Asus. And I'm gonna go ahead and slide this in. Now I do have GPU support because I will not recommend running the 3080 or the 3090 without it. It's just gonna sag and it's bad for your motherboard. This is the up here graphics card mount and this is definitely going to stabilize uh, the card from sagging. Believe me, it's incredibly good. We're gonna go ahead and get this installed with three screws. I highly recommend, like I said, installing a graphics card support bracket. These cards are heavy, and if you move your computer or pick it up or do anything, and you jolt the computer case the way this card is set up, it will definitely stress the motherboard and could damage something. And it has to do with the graphics card and the way it's designed. Uh, not all designs are equal. I like the design of some of the AMD cards that have a support that's attached up here, which stabilizes the whole card. Unfortunately, this one doesn't have it. Okay, so this bracket is going to mount just like this, as you guys can see. Now watch the graphics card as I lift up. You guys see right now it's at full sag. It should be sitting right about here. So we're gonna lift this support bracket up right now to lift the card up. There we go, guys, see that? Perfect, no damage to the motherboard like this. Gonna go ahead and put these three screws in. And you wanna make sure to have this rubber guide right here so it's not touching the fan underneath, which is right where I have it. It's the perfect spot. We're gonna get the power cables connected here for the GPU. Gonna organize these cables just a little bit better. I have got the computer organized with the extra combs in here to keep everything perfectly straight. The support is in. You can see the back vertical GPU covers back in. All the vent covers are in the back. Everything looks spectacular. It is time to boot it up. We're gonna talk about the BIOS and how that works. And as long as everything boots up and the BIOS installs, we will be ready to run some games and some benchmarks and have some fun. Here's the thing, you need a USB drive formatted in FAT32. Once you do that, you're gonna go to ASUS's website to your specific motherboard for this one specifically, the Crosshair 8 Hero. Wi-Fi, which is the board that I'm using. And I went ahead and downloaded that file and extracted it on my hard drive in my documents folder. You can pretty much put it anywhere, it doesn't matter. And you're gonna rename the BIOS file with the renaming tool, which is included in the package. Once you do that, uh, it's going to rename the file so you can put it on the root of your USB drive. So you're just gonna open it, hit enter. It's gonna rename that file. Very easy process. Make sure to put that renamed file, copy it or cut and paste it over to the root of a FAT32 formatted USB drive. Once you do that, just like I am gonna do, I'm gonna put it right here in the BIOS flashback slot. Gonna plug the power in, gonna turn it on here. And once I do that, I'm not gonna turn the power on or touch anything. And then I'm going to hold this BIOS button for three seconds till it starts flashing. If it goes solid, it means there is a problem with the BIOS file. I'm gonna have to reformat the drive and re-put the file on there in the root folder. If not, when I hold this BIOS button for three seconds, it should start flashing. I'm not gonna start the computer or touch anything till it's done flashing. That means it's completed the update 
and then I can go ahead and power on the computer. Before I do that right now with the BIOS though, I gotta go ahead and get this fan mounted in the top, which is pretty easy, and then I am done. So here is the Corsair uh, fan that I'm installing with the RGB. It's going to be installed this way because it's an exhaust fan. So I'm gonna get this mounted up in here and I'm gonna run the cables out the back first. So I'm gonna try to get these, a few more cables to run and tie up and that will be it. All right, guys, everything is running smoothly. Turns out I did not have to do the BIOS flashback update. Crazy thing is this board had generic support even for the new CPU. So even though it wasn't fully supporting the new Ryzen 5 series CPU, it was still able to boot into Windows, update all the drivers for everything else. The CPU still worked, it booted, everything was fine. So it's right here, updating the BIOS from Windows I had it done. As soon as this completes, we can do some benchmarking. looking so perfect, wouldn't you say? And I mean, performance is also damn near perfect as well. I wanna to talk to you guys about something. I love this processor and this build. However, before we get into any of the good stuff, do not overclock. If you are jumping over from Intel to AMD and this is your first AMD in a long time or ever, there's three reasons why you don't wanna overclock. One, it's a lot harder than Intel a lot and a lot more complicated. Two, you avoid your warranty, pretty much the same thing on Intel. And number three, on this specific processor or the R9 series at least, you're not gonna really see any benefit at all. And the thing is leaving it all stock, everything on auto, just throwing Performance Boost Overdrive or PBO onto enabled, I was able to achieve a score of 663 or 664 in single core and 12,900 multi-core. Now leaving it completely stock, I get 670 in single score, but only 11,900 in the multi-core. What that basically means is going with an all-core overclock is I'm losing about 2% on my single core speed and I'm only gaining 3% on my multi-core speed. Whereas with the PBO on, I'm not losing any on the single core and I'm only losing about 1% on the multi-core versus the overclock or the all-core overclock. What I'm basically saying to you guys is that with the all-core overclock, it's only gonna be a couple hundred points in CPU Z over doing the automatic with PBO. Like I said, it's only like a percent difference, like 1.2%, and you're practically losing nothing on your single core boost. It makes no sense to overclock. I did this test in Cinebench R23, and with the all core overclock and everything maxed out, 29,500 one time, and I got 30,400 the other time. With the PBO, with everything set to auto, I got almost 29,000. But to really sum it up for you guys, by leaving everything auto and throwing on PBO, it helps increase the all-core overclock automatically to almost match where you'd be manually doing everything but without losing your single core speed. So if you overclock, all your cores are gonna be faster and you lose your single core boost. You leave it on auto, you get a good single core boost, but you don't have the good all-core overclock. That's where the Dark Heroes uh, dynamic OC switching comes in handy. However, you really don't need that with the PBO on. The Dynamic OC switcher is kind of like running an all-core overclock, then it switches over to everything auto. But with the PBO, it's like running an automatic, intelligent all-core overclock switching back and forth. So essentially, the Dynamic OC switchers, two manual modes versus leaving it in auto and throwing PBO on and letting it intelligently do its thing. I've looked at the different scores and the different overclocking. If you don't have liquid nitrogen and you're not going to 4.8 or 4.9 and you don't have crazy cooling, makes no sense 
None whatsoever. I'm telling you guys, you're only losing about 1% to 2% on the multi-core and your single score is going to be damn near identical. We're talking less than half a percent. It's not even worth mentioning. If you just leave everything on auto and throw PBO on, I'm going to do a whole video on this. It really is a fantastic CPU. I can promise you it's probably the best CPU I've ever used or ever installed, benchmark tested because... They did such an amazing job on it that even overclocking it gives you almost no added benefits. I know there's going to be a lot of overclockers out there and gearheads that can get it a little bit better or use a dark hero and use the dynamic OC switcher and use two different modes all manual and it's going to be a little bit faster. But all that work and all that money for 1%, not worth it. The chip is stellar. Throw it in auto, throw PBO on, or leave PBO off. It doesn't matter. The chip is insane. There's a few caveats of using AMD, but it's really not huge. The big issue here is memory latency. It's a little bit higher, but it writes and reads a lot faster, and there's more database operations. So in any case, guys, hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for stopping in. The build's pretty sick. I'm averaging 185 to 200 frames a second in Warzone. It's nasty. We're going to have a lot of fun, guys. A lot of games coming up in live streams and a lot of videos coming up in this computer and the Intel machine that I built and also how to build your own budget gaming computer and stuff like that. A lot of stuff coming. If you guys haven't tapped that bell notification and subscribe, do so now. Check me out on Twitch, Joseph Corey. We'll see you guys in the next live stream or video. I really appreciate it, guys. Take care of yourselves in these strange times. Be safe out there.